This is back to back. Yo, what's up, back to backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the show. This is back to back. This is my podcast. How is everybody out there this week? I hope you had a good one. I hope your week is starting off right. I've been running around like crazy these last couple of weeks. There is just a lot going on, man. But it's all good. Happy to be busy. And speaking of busy, my guest on the show today is one of the hardest working groups out there. Chromio is on the show today. They've got a brand new album out right now called Head Over Heels, and they're on a world tour right now. They're just going crazy. So make sure to follow them. All the links to their dates, the new music, everything is going to be in the description of this episode. This one came together kind of last minute. I was so stoked it worked out. I'm going to tell you all about it in just a second. Before I do, let's take care of the business off the top. The first thing that I want to say is that I've been seeing so much love for this show recently, and I want to thank everybody out there who's helping to spread the word. And whether you're a first-time listener this week or a long-time supporter, I just want to let you know the best way you can support this show, the best way you can help us grow is just by word of mouth. Tell a friend if you know somebody who loves music as much as you do, somebody who would really enjoy this show, just let them know. Or you could send a tweet. Or you could put up a post somewhere, retweet us. We don't spend money on advertising here. This is a community-based show. I love doing it, and it's so great to see the support coming back. Don't forget to subscribe to the show as well. That way, each week when I post a new episode, it's just going to get delivered straight to your device, however, wherever you listen. No fuss, no muss. You don't have to check it. It's just going to show up hanging out with me on a Tuesday morning. Or, you know, whenever you're listening to this, at the gym, in your car, you know, spend a romantic evening with me in the bath after a long day, light some candles. You know, everybody enjoys podcasts differently. No judgment. In return, another fun thing I do around this show is the Back to Bangers Spotify playlist. That's a playlist that I update every single week with brand new music from myself, from the guests we have on the show, and with a lot of the music that we talk about each week in these interviews. So if you hear us mention a song and you've never heard it, or it's something you kind of remember but you want to hear again, all you have to do is go check out the Back to Bangers playlist on Spotify. The link to that is going to be in the description of this episode. People really seem to dig it. I love putting it together. Definitely go check it out. I've also been talking to a ton of you guys lately. You know, you can always hit me up at backtobackpod at gmail.com. That's the email address. Or you can hit me on social media at Willie Joy or at backtobackpod. I love to meet listeners of this show. Love to throw ideas back and forth. You can hit me up with questions, comments, concerns. Let me know who you'd like to hear on the show. Let's chat. Let's party. Let's have a good time. So, for this conversation with Chromio, I ran into Dave One out in New York at the wedding of our good friend Nick Catch Dubs. So good to see him. A lot of old faces. It was great to see everybody. Shout out to Nick and Karen on the wedding. Man, that was amazing. And it was just great to see Dave. He and I don't see a lot of each other. We're not super close friends, but I've always enjoyed running into him. We always have a good time. Super last minute, we set up this podcast on the other side of the country, out at their studio in sunny Burbank, California. This was their one-off day in months and months of touring. Their new album, Head Over Heels, is out right now. They've been crazy busy, pounding the pavement, running all over the world, touring their asses off. They've carved out this amazing, unique space for themselves. They're truly in their own lane, five albums into the game and they can still straddle all of these different scenes you know dance music indie rock electro pop you know all over the map and we talk about this in the conversation you know how do you keep that wide appeal how do you stay true to your original vision and both dave and p i think are true artists there's a lot of thought that goes into what they do i think they've been really responsible in large part for bringing that funk sound back to music. 
you know, they were doing it long before Calvin Harris put out a funk album, before Bruno Mars was doing funk. Chromio was there carrying the torch. They've always been an act I think you can really rely on. They're always pushing the boundaries, not just with their music, but with their live show. The production on this new tour is crazy. We talk about all of it, and these guys are just the best. I think everyone out there is really going to enjoy this. So let's get into it right now. This is me and Chromio back to back. Let's go. <laughs> Great to see you both. Dave, I just saw you in New York a couple weeks ago. Catch Dubs wedding. Man, shout out to our good friends, uh, Nick Catch Dubs and Karen Rose, who just got married. That's, uh, I can't think of a more perfect, ideal couple. That's right. You know? <laughs> It was uh, predestined. <laughs> Nick, uh, co-founder of Fool's Gold Records, uh, also previous guest on this show. And now we're out here in sunny Burbank. Yep. At this amazing complex, uh, which you were telling me you guys have had for two and a half two years? Two and a half years, yeah. It's very on brand. Mm -hmm. The whole vibe, the, the color scheme, the materials in the walls. From velvet to cork. <laughs> Runs we the cover camera. all We cover all textiles <laughs> and textures. <laughs> and so this is where you guys recorded Head Over Heels yeah. right. entirely. Was there a particular reason you chose to come out here, out to Burbank? I guess just space was, you know, you can get a big spot like this. You couldn't find this in New York, right? obviously. Yeah. And um, yeah, I guess space and, and resources um, were easier to come by out here. So, And also this studio took little to no investment. So, oh, Well, that's a plus. <laughs> what was this before? It was exactly this. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we brought in the equipment and that's it. Brought in the furniture, brought in the equipment. A little bit of funk, but I'm sure there was some funk in here before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How important or, or how much of an effect do you guys think the space has on the eventual recording? You know, obviously aesthetic and vibe is very important to you. Yeah. I mean, you know, we spend so much time here. It's like decorating your house. Your decoration will put you in a good mood, you know. Yeah. It'll, it'll change your, your vibe at home, same when you're working. How have previous uh, places you've recorded affected the vibe? I don't know, because we had like a we had like a crummy little basement in Bushwick when we did the last album, and we were happy campers out there too. Yeah. It was great. Do you I think, think the it's music really, sounds different as a result? I just think it's got to be with the vibe between us, kind of like how we feel about, you know, working and if we're inspired and obviously being here is cool but i'm pretty sure we could be anywhere if if we were in a good headspace we could make cool music you know this place is really great just because we can bring in musicians there's a vocal booth it's i mean we were just we were spending so much money on studio time in new york because we had a our, our production room but to track and stuff we just had to go places and you know it just it just got cost prohibitive so doing it here all under one roof is amazing and as you saw there's a little rehearsal space so we can like practice our live versions and Vaughn Oliver has a room here and he's you know he's a, a precious asset to the Chromeo team and the Chromeo sound mm. you need to have him on a pod I know yeah, yeah I would love to it's actually been a while since I've seen Vaughn but let's talk a little bit about Oliver for a second because they're I love Oliver and I think they're one of the underappreciated gems of this little scene that we're all in you know and they've been around for forever how long have you guys been working with them since the last album okay so we started on on a white woman and um yeah they've they've been our partners ever since um Vaughn's toured with us and Ollie does a lot of co-producing for us and Vaughn as does Vaughn I mean they both they both work with us in different capacities um, Vaughn will work on on a lot of sonics a lot of like enhancing of tracks that we've worked on and then mixing as well and then Ollie will be kind of like 
producing with us or creating with us. I mean, there's, yeah. They're yeah, I mean, sonically, they're kind of untouchable, untouchable I think. Untouchable, untouchable. Yeah, if uh, any producers out there listening, if you have not checked out Oliver's last album, I would immediately uh, listen to the rest of this podcast and then go get yeah, that it's, album. It's crazy. And even their singles on Fool's Gold and stuff, it's just, it's bananas. Yeah. I mean, it's, and then, you know, we could, you could talk about that with him, but to think that Vaughn does all this on Pro Tools 10 with stock plugins. Jesus, I didn't know that. It's crazy. Oh, man. And, and, and $500 speakers. <sighs> wow. And are you guys still living out in New York? I I'm I just moved back. Oh, okay. But P's still here. We, we both relocated to LA when it was time to start this out, al- the last album. And um, I lasted about two years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. Some cities just don't gel with people. Like yeah. I remember uh, when when Josh, uh, yeah, me too, mm-hmm. moved out to New York for whatever, six months or a year. That when he, was that? It was, uh, I think it was around the time Liz Oh, I remember. I remember. She there. was, she was, um, she was, it was like a summer. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a while ago. Yeah, well, yeah, no, it was a ways back, but I just remember talking to him about it because in his mind, I think it was going to be a longer term thing. Right. And then he just, didn't last out there. I think Kurt just moved out here. Kurt's in LA. Yeah. yeah. I just saw him the other day. It's crazy. We were talking about Nick's wedding and there were so many faces. Uh, were you, you were not there, right? Pete? No, I was supposed to come, but we had, uh, we had uh, some, the, our tour started the next day. Oh, fun. And I had to be, right. I had to be there at 6 a.m. in Montreal. So, yeah, fair enough, man. <laughs> yeah, but it was just Sorry, a cool. Sorry, Karen and, Kate and Nick. But no, it was just a cool cast of characters from kind of back in the day. And, and it felt very much like uh, getting the gang back together to me. There were some faces I hadn't seen in a long time. And Cosmo was there DJing. Nice. And, Ayers, DJ Lindsay. Yeah, Craze was there. Craze, Denise, the It's the Real Guys. Right, man, all of all of those. Anyway, I, I just, I love those rare opportunities because I think doing what we do and especially what you guys do where you're just going kind of all the time, it, those moments when we can kind of actually connect with our friends who do similar stuff, they're very rare and increasingly hard to come by. I mean, for you guys, you both came out of Montreal originally, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And what was what was Montreal like at the time as a kid? Because I've only known it as an adult, and it's one of my favorite cities to go to. Uh, you know, it has sort of the same way we were talking about this studio has a strong aesthetic and a strong vibe. I mean, Montreal, there's kind of nowhere else like it. <laughs> Montreal definitely has a strong identity. Yeah, it's very... It, it, if you try to ignore it, someone will kind of put it in your yeah. face, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, what was it like growing up as a kid? Were you guys in the city proper, in suburbs? Well, we, P lived in the suburbs, but we were, we were in the city all the time. Yeah. I went to school. Um, I lived in the suburbs. I went to school in the city. That's where we met. <clears throat> yeah. And I pretty much spent my, my teenage years in the city. I, would, I wouldn't go back... On the weekends, I would stay at friends' houses. Yeah, we were going out all the time, going record shopping, going to parties. Mm. You know, we were we were definitely little scenester kids. Yeah. All you know, in high school and all the way through college. Um, yeah, we were everywhere. I mean, what was the scene at the time? Well, when when we first met in the in the early nineties, um, well, Montreal always had like a massive electronic music scene, but we didn't know about it because we weren't into that kind of music. Right, but. You know, names like um, DJ Pierre, Richie Houghton, Danny Tenaglia. Um, Tiga. T- yeah, obviously. Well, Tiga's a resident. But I mean, like, we would see these people on flyers since we were kids. We just didn't know who they were. Actually, let me try. Man, on Instagram, I, I just saw um, somebody posted a flyer for a rave in Montreal where Daft Punk played. Okay. A track played, Tiga played, oh, man. somebody like I think DJ Snake. Um, no, I'm sorry, not DJ Snake. DJ, um, what's the house guy from Chicago? Your boy, Sneak. Mm. Sneak. Oh, sorry, sh- man. Shout out to DJ Sneak. Sneak, yeah. yeah. Um, Sneak was it was. It's insane. It looks like one of those dream flyers. You right, know what I mean? Right. 
Um, well, I remember, uh, you know, I was born in Minneapolis and came up in the Midwest rave scene and the Canadian raves always in the 90s, like mid to late 90s. Bananas. I wanted to go so bad. I never yep. got to, but those flyers were just crazy. Yeah, I'll try to find it, but it, it's, it looks unreal. But we weren't in that scene so much. When, we, when P and I met, it was like more of like kind of getting out of an acid jazz funk thing, which was pretty big in our city. And then getting into a hip hop thing, and that too was big in Montreal. It was close to New York. You know, all the all the New York acts would come up. Yeah, you kind of get the runoff a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> we were in like you know the record digging scene. I'm gonna try to find that flyer. Like we had friends who had you know Dusty's nights where they would play samples, they totally. play old music, and that was our jam. Mm. We would go out to those, and we were just like the record nerds. Yeah, <laughs> right. like you know, you could go to a club on our. I mean, our boy Similac, who's still one of the the mainstay DJs in Montreal. You know, we'd have he'd have a he had a weekly, and and you know, he's out there in Montreal playing Bob James records. You know, like every week, it was mm. just like that. Um, it was amazing. It was it was uh, there was a lot of resources there for us to learn about the kind of music that we want to make that we wanted to make, and that we. I guess that we went on to make, you know. Sure. I mean, were you guys musical as kids? Were you playing instruments? Yeah, we were in our little band together as yeah. teenagers, you know. Oh, you guys together? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We had like a, a band together and we were playing like kind of um like, you know, we were into instrumental hip hop a la a la the roots maybe. Sure. We were just trying to do we were trying different things. Um and then we started, uh, and then we started um, making beats and producing hip hop. I mean, I, I guess I'm curious how much of a serious thing it was or not at that time. Was it, you know, kind of just something you were doing for fun? Yeah, you it, were was, it, it. Was it was for fun, but weekends. yeah, but we still like. Just like what we're doing now, we have fun, but we take it seriously. Right. We would still wake up at 9 a.m., show up to rehearsal at 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Yeah. Which is crazy when you're 17, 18. <laughs> that is actually amazingly organized. It's like, you know, <laughs> usually that's the time where you sleep and you don't want to, you know. At that age, though, I mean, that's that magical age where you can stay out till five in the morning and then and then up wake at up nine. at seven, yeah, straight yeah. up. Were your uh, were your parents musical? Was nope. that at all? No. Anti-negative. <laughs> I mean, my, my parents listen to music. There's always no. Music your parents playing. had good, good, good taste in totally. music. Yeah, but, not musicians, but, but, but not musicians. Right. What did they think uh, for either of you guys about you kind of going down that road? Were they supportive? Were they trying to put other options in front of you? Um, I mean, for me, it was a bit harder. I guess my parents are, you know, Mediterranean and. It was it wasn't a thing that was encouraged. Yeah, until you reach a point where they see you on TV, and then it's like, oh, my son. <laughs> right. <laughs> then all the bragging that's been yeah. building up comes out. Yeah, but in the beginning, it's like, can I get a synthesizer? No, it's for girls. <laughs> 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 for girls. <laughs> but true story, I I bribed my sister to ask for my first keyboard. Holy shit. For her birthday. That's amazing. <laughs> that was my first Korg M1. I mean, they, they call, call everything they, piano, so it right. doesn't matter to them. They, but. they, they thought, uh, they called the guitar the mandolin. Yeah. Oh, man. And they're asking P why he's playing yeah. the mandolin. <laughs> I had to, yeah. I asked for a guitar for my birthday. They, my father wouldn't get it to me. He's like, mm. no, ask for something more, more masculine. Wow. Fair I enough. bought my first guitar with my, yeah. That's so interesting because I mean now we're at a point, and especially in in dance music, where there aren't enough women. You yeah, know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. And how did it evolve for you guys? You know, going uh, through high school into college years, obviously still playing music, but was it a serious thing? Like, when did it become more of a serious thing, or something that maybe you? foresaw a future in um well you know when we were when when we were like budding hip-hop producers when we, i'm looking i'm really looking oh for no this. i I'm want looking, you to find I'm looking it for, like, i can't wait for you to find it and then just talk about it and <laughs> no listeners can't see it yeah. <laughs> no but i'm just i just want to read about you i just put it as read the, up the, fly- the cover for your yeah, podcast yeah. no i mean if you actually find it i'll totally <laughs> the post flyers which <laughs> is just was is just so crazy that all these n- names right would come would be in Montreal and play yeah. in Montreal, and 
you know, again, we, we didn't really know who they were. But then when we learned, when we became part of the electronic music community, they were all, um, they were all like familiar names. And we were like, wait, we used to, we used to know about, I mean, this is crazy. Look, for instance, all right, 1993, 1993, Moby Orbital Aphex Twin oh, in man. Montreal. Like, I have a feeling also, just to go back to Montreal for really quick, I have a feeling also um, that a lot of people would play Montreal. San Francisco was big in, yeah. the, in the rave scene. Yeah, I remember that. San Francisco, Montreal, but I don't think, you know, elsewhere in North America there was the same that same energy. And I also feel like Montreal... Um, because there was a European connection, you would get a lot of, you know, European DJs come through. It was crazy. Um, anyways, but yeah, like, man, the Hard Kiss Brothers. Oh, Hard Kiss Brothers, yeah. It's, it's insane. And we knew all those, like, we we knew we knew all the people who made the flyers. We knew all the people who, who, made, who promoted the parties. And basically when A-Track won his DMC, right. we were all up in there. You know, but but we weren't doing electronic music yet. Sure. Well, I mean, the barrier for entry was a lot lower then too, right? I think the scenesters, the kids who were excited, if you just showed up enough, you could kind of get yourself involved, right? Probably, which, yeah. Which is not the way, like I remember it back in Minneapolis growing up, I had some friends who would do visuals and and I mean they were just little 15 16 year old kids they were not professionals they'd show up with like four VCRs and sort right. of a janky old mixer and, and uh just because they kept showing up eventually this club just let them do visuals for you know anyone who would come yeah, through yeah, of course and, well, it was just more more grassroots oh yeah I mean, but you know then they end up doing visuals for a lot of those people you just named basement jacks you know all that kind it's of crazy. stuff yeah and they're just 15 year old like they don't know what they're doing I it was, it was, it was, yeah it was more it was more approachable for sure yeah yeah there's definitely more gatekeepers at this point for better or for worse um but anyway sorry so back back to what we were talking about i didn't mean to no no that's that's what podcasts I didn't mean to, are for, baby. Yeah, but I didn't mean to derail us like crazy. It was just, <laughs> it's just such a trip to look at all this. Yeah. Well, I think we were talking about sort of when it became a little more serious, or when in your mind you sort of thought. Uh, it I mean, it was something. weird because I was still in I was in grad school throughout albums one, two, and three. You know, so and was school your focus there? I was, thought it. I thought it was going to be, um, but you know, obviously we were still uh, we were still making music quite seriously and touring a lot. I just thought I could do both until... Um, 2007? No, <laughs> even later. Even later? later? Yeah, I stopped teaching in 2011. Oh, so, man. Yeah, it was... It, it stayed, but, you know, we were taking... We basically, as soon as we started... Um, as soon as Fancy Footwork came out, we started taking Chromio very seriously because mm. that's when we started selling out shows and the, the touring thing became really sustainable for us. So, What was it leading up to that point? You know, I'm curious about sort of that, that first album and even leading up to that. What did people think of you guys at the time? What was the reception like? Because I don't think... I, I, when I was coming over here to talk to you, I was trying to think about what else was going on musically at the time and whether, you know, crowds who didn't know you, this is the first time they're seeing you, would they have a frame of reference? Like, what was the reaction to what you were trying to do? We're not feeling it. <laughs> really? I mean, some, there were some early adopters, of course. Yeah. Um, but, but in many cases, it was met with, um, it was met with, uh, with skepticism and, you know, I mean, there was the, the, whoever was around then and was refer like we're talking about like the early to mid two thousands. It's so dope, DJ Pierre, a guy called Gerald, back to back. <laughs> oh, it's it's bananas. I mean, we we could have <laughs> there was a whole house education to be had. And we just kind of fronted on it, but um, anyways, but yeah, like in when we started Chromio, you know, the people who were sort of referencing eighties sounds were. You know, L DFA Records and Fisher Spooner, yeah. and the whole Electro Clash thing, 
Um, Trevor Jackson out of the UK did it really well. And was that scene accepting of you guys? Half and half. Yeah. You know, half and half because we came with a funk sound and we were referencing black music from the 80s. So mm. it was like, it, it, you know, it, it was, and also we were on Vice Records. Right. And that know. came through Tiga, right? Who we well, mentioned? No. Oh, well, okay. we, we first signed to Turbo, just Tiga's label. Um, but then... Vice Records signed us for the U.S. I see. And then, I mean, it was this whole convoluted thing, but... Um, Isn't it always, though? Yeah, and then and then Atlantic inherited us uh, and after they split ways with Vice. So it was a whole thing. But the, the point is, um, we, we ca- of course, we understand why people thought we might have been like a little bit, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek and jokey and all that it was also like a huge period for rock music right you know like the strokes were peaking and white stripes were peaking and and um and you know we got it and we were just like okay whatever we 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 did our thing and and believed in the music that we were so fond of and um was and that w- I, I you know to make that music was that sort of the original goal is just that you guys were such fans of this music yep you wanted to get that vibe mm-hmm. yep 100 percent. like we we had gone through our hip-hop phase we were hip-hop producers then all our hip-hop friends were asking us for like swizz type beats and we didn't know how to make those beats because we were still working with samplers and and making like lord finesse type yeah, beats more boom bap boom bappy beats so we we're like i don't know how to do that you know I, I can't make bounce beats or many fresh beats or any of that and even the people who were making sample based hip-hop at the time you know that's when like just blaze and them came out so they were using tritons it was like just this other the art form was changing so we we're like you know what let's just start something else and tiga offered me a record deal kind of just on the strength and then i brought in p and we loved 80s music and p loved synths and i loved robert palmer and we were listening to like you know the oldies at noon on on like the local radio stations and they would play huey lewis and timex social club and and new edition and and hollow notes of course and we were like this is like this is essentially this is electronic music Mm. but with lyrics you know, and it's synth music, it's electronic music with lyrics, and no one's come close to referencing it except for Daft Punk on Discovery yeah. and Stuart Price on Le Ritme Digital. Stuart Price is the OG to make like an 80s funky album. Yeah, people kind of forget about him. He's the GOAT. He's one of the greatest electronic p- producers and pop producers and of our era, and, and he, he was the first dude to do it. So... You know, he was like, the, he's the original Calvin Harris, really. Yeah, yeah, in I fact, think that's accurate. Yeah, and Calvin learned, I don't I've, I don't know Calvin Harris, but in hearing Calvin Harris's approach to production, I hear a lot of Stuart Price mannerisms. I never thought about that, but yeah, you're kind of right. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. When you really listen closely, I think Calvin Harris is a bass player, Stuart Price is a bass player, and the way they both just like approach Pocket and... and um, yeah, it's just like I hear affiliation there. Anyway, but so we were like, okay, let's do that kind of thing, but even more Jerry Curl, and let's have all the songs have vocals. Right. You know, and that's how that's how Chromeo started. And, you know, the first album was all over the place. We did it all ourselves. We had no idea what we were doing. We had never written songs before. I had never sang on a mic before. Literally. I'd really? Never, yeah, never. Really? Yeah, never, never. Wow. Um, that's that's Needy lucky, Girl, man. Needy Girl is the first song I ever sang on a microphone. Holy shit. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. That's lucky, man. That's uh, guess, your yeah. voice now seems so perfect for what you do. I mean, it took a minute. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah, and so and so, you know, by by fancy footwork, we kind of knew what we were doing. We had a couple extra pieces of equipment and luckily things worked out. So, around that time, Fancy Footwork, which was what, second album? Yeah. What was the experience there? Because you guys had been uh, grinding for years at that point, right? Mm-hmm. You know, doing shows where maybe the reception was off, yep. trying to get people to understand the message. And then here's all the-, the thing is that, like, for the first album, there was no social media. By the time Fancy Footwork came around, MySpace appeared. So even on the first album, there was no way of us to even get people, you know, the, the local promoter in, in Philly 
I mean, he could only get people to come to our show by handing out flyers. It was it was yeah. like punk rock, you know? Right. And what, blogs, I guess? No, no blogs. Not even yeah, blogs? Not even. <clears throat> no blogs. Mm. So by the time Fancy Forward came out, blogs had appeared and MySpace was huge. It was like what Instagram is now, you know? So, so word got out faster and there was also like a burgeoning new electronic music scene that locally we kind of became a part of. Right. And all of a sudden... We're playing shows with Holotronics, with Spank Rock, um, um, and fr- like I lived in Paris at the time, and we were playing shows with all. The, you know, we had a song on Ed Banger with DJ Meddy, and yeah. we were playing shows with those guys, and and then we were going up to London all the time, and you know, we were playing for Errol Alkin and those people. So it just all, you know, Annie Max started supporting us, so it all made sense globally. There was just like a new f- new dance scene indie dance or whatever you want to call it blog house and all that and we fit right in yeah was that kind of a relief at that point to finally find some like-minded people like did you feel like you were maybe just a little ahead of the curve or that you know yeah or or did it feel like competition or like people were starting to? no we were i mean we were definitely on our own lane we just got sort of lumped up in it but we were Definitely doing our own thing the whole time. Yeah. You know, we're playing before Justice, but we're playing sexy saxophone songs. Right. And they're coming on after us, you know, doing like, you know, sort of like their first album was like pretty glitchy, hardcore. Yeah, Yeah, hard. Hard electro, but we fit in because we were the same group of friends and we were like-minded. And also through remixes, we could create those links and stuff. And Right. We were definitely running in parallel from everything. And and some of those remixes too, I remember... Like, uh, what was the one I, I would always play? Oh, it was the the Scream remix of Night, Night by, by Night. Night. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was big. Fire. Yeah, so good, man. Fire. So good. There's another guy, if you want to look at influential people who maybe don't get their due at this point. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a beast. He's been a visionary. But no, stuff like that would definitely bridge the gap. And I think somewhere around that time is probably when I saw you first perform I was DJing for Melissa, kid sister, right. at the time. And we actually, I just remembered this, we did a show opening for you guys in Brooklyn that was... Um, Studio B? It wasn't Studio B, it was one of the outdoor summer... Oh, yeah. Concerts. Oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it got rained out. Yeah, and, and I remember this because it, it's in my brain as maybe like my top 15 musical uh like movie moments because uh, when we were playing i was having so much trouble the wind was like blowing my records off the tables and all that kind of stuff it was kind of a mess and then you guys went on and uh, i forget what song but whatever the big single was at the Fancy time Fancy yeah, so you, yeah. you, people started dancing in the rain well, going crazy. right when you got to the chorus it was like the skies just opened up <laughs> Mm-hmm. And like just buckets of rain, and people went nuts. You yeah. know, nobody I rem- ran. I remember away. that like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah one of those fun. electric moments, man. It was. And I think like one of the city councilmen or aldermen was there to yeah. introduce you. It was crazy. I mean, yeah, that was already night by night was out at that point. Yeah, yeah. So we were, we were, you were cooking. We we're cooking. Yeah, we were cooking with gas by then. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> And do you guys enjoy the the touring lifestyle? You know, once it started to really get going, started to really get hectic, was that something you just kind of embraced, got right into, or was there? As soon as people started liking us, we liked it. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah I guess I can't argue with that. Yeah, as soon as people liked us, we liked it right back, and we were like, okay, this is fun. And you know, P and I had always been like natural performers, I guess. <laughs> sure. So we we definitely felt like it was a calling. When I think at this point, you guys are known for the live performance aspect. I think there's a certain reputation that Chromio has of just a a solid live act, uh, you know, a festival act, quote unquote, yep. whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it. it. And I know that's something you guys cultivate. And the obviously the aesthetic that we've been talking about this whole time goes into that performance. Uh, I saw some pictures of the the new tour set up with the stairs and all that. It's fucking yeah. crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just try to keep growing and to make it interesting for all the fans that have joined us around along the way, whether they're day one fans or fans that got familiar with us on Jealous, mm. you know, on their last album. It doesn't matter. Like, we just want to make it interesting for, for everybody. And actually, we're planning totally different things for next year, touring-wise as well. 
like we're we're gonna switch the format. We're gonna finally do live band stuff next year. Oh yeah, more than just the two of you. Oh yeah, yeah. we want to go like full new power generation. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, in your hometown. Oh yeah, no, hundred percent. That's, that's where we're gonna premiere it. Ooh, I love that. My old trumpet teacher from when I was a kid uh, played with NPG for a little yeah. bit. I mean, in Minneapolis, all roads lead to Prince. Pretty much, man. Yeah, <laughs> everybody has a Prince story. They do. They, I have Prince stories, you know, because he would just show up every once in a while. Yeah. It was bizarre. It's amazing. Yeah, you know, he'd just show up and like sit down. You know, he wouldn't announce it. They wouldn't say anything. But then you just kind of look over, be like who's playing piano right now and just be he's just there yeah. <laughs> you never saw him come in and you never saw him leave yeah. that was the thing. <laughs> he vanishes it's <laughs> yeah. crazy what are you guys feeling uh, you know now that he's passed and there's this vault of recordings that clearly people want to monetize and get out there i don't know how i feel about it man like if they should all just be heard or if you know in respecting the the man he was they should stay hidden i mean i've heard some of them because vaughn's got like a crazy hard drive of unreleased unreleased print stuff oh really he's the plug yeah and it's hot i think everybody should hear it but you know obviously there's legalities and i don't know what his family wants and the estate and all that but yeah more prints in the world the better I mean, from the sound of it, it's like they could put out a new album for the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys do that? You have like, how, nope. how much gets left on the cutting room floor for you? For this, on Head Over Heels, it's the first time that a lot of stuff got left on the cutting room floor. But before that, we would say we're doing an 11 song album. We're going to make 12 songs. One's going to be, you know, not going to make it. But now that we have the, st- it's weird. I mean, you know, we changed our approach for Head Over Heels and we went. You know, it took us a long time, and it was very labor-intensive. It's what we wanted to do. And, um, you know, it gave us our slickest album yet. And, like, when we listen to a song like Bad Decision, P and I are like, all right, this is, like, as clean and big and pro as we'll go. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's pretty much... You found that edge. Yeah, and it doesn't mean we have to stay there. Well, I mean, that's something I, I think is interesting about what you guys do is... With something as defined as Chromio that, you know, is a very strong, like you say the name of the band and you get an image in your head, right? (laughs) Yeah. And so in that framework, how do you stay innovative? How do you keep it fresh and exciting for you and not feel like you're sort of retreading the same themes and the same aesthetics that you've touched on? Is that a conscious thing or is it more? Yeah, it's something we think about all the time. And, and... You know, I think there's a lot of places for us to go within the, the, the confines of what we're doing. We like creating within constraints. That's why we use so much analog equipment. Mm. And I think, yeah, the, the honestly, in a weird way, the smaller the sandbox, the easier it gets for me mm-hmm. to create in a yeah. weird way. So it's all about like digging further and further into your like frame of references and just being, hey, wait a minute, nobody ever talked about this. Mm. And then you sort of go on you follow the trail and you know see where it takes you like that's that that p i I think you think very much in those terms and i I, for me i start to think of like how it can resonate culturally Mm. in the present musical landscape and and if there's a spot for that kind of reference and stuff interesting and yeah i think there's a lot of room for us to still grow you know like the the challenge is that we want to preserve a little bit of the cheekiness right uh, but we're also adults, so <laughs> you know it, it's just got to stay. And and also, we can't let the core fans down because they expect stuff from us, right? You know what I mean? Like, and and we have to deliver that. Sure. When I, I think as you keep growing and evolving, probably that pressure gets more intense, right? Like I think about a song like Jealous, uh. and you know when that drops and that goes super crazy. Were you guys having people in your ear yes. all of a sudden yeah. telling you to like make another one of those? Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with that? Did you feel pressure like you had yeah. to follow it up like that? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. <clears throat> That's how Head Over Heels became. You know, like this is was this was the new the bar, the new bar, and we took it from there. But it, we wouldn't have done it. I think if it, we didn't feel it was a challenge. Mm-hmm. If it was just like this corny thing of like, 
all right, guys, you know, Max Martin's going to do your next album. Right. If we hadn't seen a challenge in, in working with songs, you know, that meet a new bar that we set for ourselves, we wouldn't have done it. The, the challenge for us was trying to make, you know, a bigger, slicker version of Chromio that's more balls out, more in your face, where the humor is right there in your face, where the, the slickness, the huge sound, the massive which mixes. Is, yeah. Which is what Jealous was. Yeah, and, and, then, and then, like, that was a challenge for us. And as we start working on new material, there'll be other challenges. Sure. Like, I have a few challenges in mind, I'm sure P does as well, of things we want to accomplish moving forward. But if it's not, you know, it has to be that. And maybe that's the key to what we were just talking about, about how to keep it exciting and fresh and all that is, you know, if you always just have to keep challenging yourself, right? For us, yeah. And and because we came into this game as non-seasoned, kind of like faux musicians, there's always room for us to <laughs> tell, you know, to improve. I, like I told you, I'd never... I never sang before Needy Girl. P was barely a keyboard player when Chromio started, and now he's like an expert, you know. Mm. And and we. How were, long did you feel like you were, you know, uh, faking it or you know, the whole time. amateur? Still, still, now. yeah. I mean, we're, I don't know. I mean, now I'm a little more confident, but I mean, I think we all feel like that to a certain extent. But I mean, if you're not faking it, I don't know you. It's not faking it because the records are us. It's not like yeah, no, that's the wrong term, but more more so just uh, you know, like there's t- still in 2018, I've had situations I'm in or gigs I play or anything where I'm just like, you know, sometimes it's a bill I'm on with other uh, people that I think are super talented, and you know, sometimes you just have those days where, at least for me, I'm like, man, uh, I am lucky to be in this situation. Yeah, but right you're now. there for a reason. They booked you for a reason. Oh, 100%. You're offering something, so. Right, but at least for me, I think that slight insecure feeling right. fuels me in a sure, way. Sure, same, same. I mean, I feel like for us, you know, P and I look at, our, look at all the things we don't know how to do yet. And, you know, a, a silly example is like, you know, we were still using our trusty Pentium Two, <laughs> yes. uh, up until the last album. <laughs> Shout out to Pentium. Shout out to Pentium. And then on this one, we were like, "All right, can we let's let's move to Cubase? Come on, it's time." <laughs> and then yeah. you know, but that, again, that was a challenge because like we still have to have it all be MIDI. It still had to all be you know hardware, outboard gear. But like, can we do it on a computer that doesn't have to be you know a Pentium from nineteen ninety seven? Right. As silly as that is, but like you change a way of working that's inherent to who you are and have you worked for a decade is challenging. And that's also why you choose those disciplines. Like even the most advanced jazz musician will tell you, I will never know everything. Mm. I'm learning every day. It's it's a constant this is what's satisfying about what we do. Yeah. Well you'll never be done learning. How did you? I think that's for me. Sorry to say, no, no. I think that's for me. Like when people say, like, like, oh, you know, you stopped academia to do music. Is there anything French literature that in Chromio that you? And it's no, but I do. What P just said is definitely a commonality between academia and and making music, especially for people like us. I mean, there's there's you know there's shredders out there or like real Berkeley type musos for whom there's no real mystery. I mean, that's you know, interesting. If you know every chord and like the theory behind every song, you can break it down instantly. But there's always new ways to interpret, oh, yeah, interpret sure. and perform them. One hundred. That's where that's where they keep going. Yeah, and they're never bored of their one thing they're good at. Right. You know? True. And it, so, so for me, there's a parallel because it's like you know, with, with academia, you can never master it. You know, you you never finish your paper. You relinquish it, but you could still work on it forever. Same goes with songs. And um, this idea that you're always perfecting your craft, you know. And, and with us, it's like we, it's funny to talk about perfecting your craft when we're talking about Chromio songs. Right. But it's hard. Like, it's really a fine line because one false move and it's Weird Al Yankovic. And one false move, and it's Maroon Five. I always and say then that. another false move, and it's a joke record. You know, that's right? Why, yeah, right, right. Well, and that's that's actually really interesting to think about because uh, I mean, I'm a huge nerd. I'm I'm come from a well educated background, that kind of thing, and 
I also, you know, make and am known for, I think, what a lot of people would think of as kind of lowbrow music. Not that Chromio is lowbrow, but I'm saying this about myself. And it's it's a weird thing. I, I was thinking about this with what you guys do too, where it's there's all of this thought that goes into what ends up being... Uh, you know, sort of a fun product for people. Totally, and you can. I mean, we there's definitely a lowbrow side to what we do, but hopefully, there's like a deep, highbrow thing in there somewhere too. Yeah. But it depends. Like, it doesn't. You don't have to. You can enjoy it on whatever level you want. That's that's I think the key. But it does also strike me sometimes when I see like electronic music producers, even more like techno producers, who are actually virtuosos, and like they make music with seven tracks of, of of music and it's like you know four on the floor and i'm like you can play all that stuff but yet you constrain yourself to making very minimalistic tracks mm. I, I think there's some there's an elegance to that you know, yeah and commitment when i think about uh your brother a track as well you know and what he does with fool's gold and his whole career it's it's all very intentional it's all very well thought out conceptualized but then again, yeah, the end product is, you know, he's playing in front of people who are jumping up and down. And it's sort of that weird space. I think that's maybe what keeps me around a little bit is I can both be a nerd and a kid at the same time. I know? think same goes with us. Like yeah. when we're playing a festival and it's a bunch of kids. I, I love like the festival we just played last weekend and even like the L.A. show we just played at the Palladium. It's like there's there's a, an energy to it. Our new realization is that we're not the only adults in the room who are acting like kids. A lot of our audience <laughs> now are adults. And then they a lot grew of, up with you, they right? They grew up with us, and now they're bringing their kids to Chromeo shows. Like, we never thought we'd see that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, we on this tour, we've met the first generation of kids who grew up listening to Chromeo music. Like, six, seven-year-olds. That, that this We are... You know, we're the music that their parents has, have played them since they were born. It's crazy. Does that change the way you make music or go about thinking about writing songs? Like now that you know there's a bigger <laughs> no. audience? Like, no. I mean, no. I mean, I guess if it already worked, then why? Yeah, we know what they want. Yeah. <laughs> and do you guys uh, do, I, you know, Dave, I know you do DJ sets. Is there a Chromio DJ set? Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, we do a bunch. Right, I, Key, I knew piece. that you did. I didn't know. If no, you're still... we just did. We just did three last weekend. Oh shit! All right. <laughs> and what changes there? Is that sort of just a, a a fun thing you can do to kind of play the music you love and not have to cart the gear around? And uh, yeah, it's it's another much. it's yeah. yeah it's another it's another thing we can do, and. Um, there's a very specific intersection of music that we play when we DJ. Um, and I think throughout the years, our DJ sets have had kind of like identity crises. Mm. But now I can finally say that the stuff we play has kind of a unified sound and we're not making any kind of like EDM or trap concessions. And you were before. Kind of had to. Yeah. You know, 2012, 2013, if they're putting us in a big tent at a festival, you have to drop big things. But now we don't need to anymore. Yeah. And we can really, it, it's cool. Like we play the funk, it's like a lot of disco house. I don't know what those real categories are, but like it's a lot of disco house, a lot of like kind of just funky house music and a lot of, um, yeah, just like the funkier Sample heavy, yeah, sample based house, sample based house, but you know, like Claptone, Oliver, you know, Nora and Pure, yeah, it's like that kind of stuff. And I think there's actually a pretty big appetite for that right now, more too. so now, definitely. Um, in 2007, in the in the boys' noise days, I mean, there's I don't want to say boy, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, um, pigeonhole boys noise no, in, in that no. era but let's say in the, in that kind of like distorted electro yes. days you can't everyone wanted to hear one thing um now it's more it's more i guess um sectioned off where yeah right yeah well Does you're right sense? i mean you know talking about 07 08 kind of everyone was just in one group 
you know? Because, I mean, I feel like the DJ sets on this album cycle have been, to me at least, the most satisfying. When you think about, like, even the gig we just did on Sunday night, like, mm-hmm. we could play any... It wasn't like they wanted to hear one kind of music. Right. And then think about, like, when we played that place Good Room um, in New York after the uh, the second show, upstairs, that like thing. Like, they were super into all the disco edits, and, and they were going off, you know? It used to be, like... Either you had to hit him with bangers or, I mean, I remember when all anybody wanted to hear was trap music. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A hundred percent. Those people are still out there. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, what's cool now is it's, it's sort of, it's more divided, I guess. Yeah. Right? They, yeah. Yeah. They've moved from where we were, we were playing and there are other places now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And it sort of kind of sections things off. Yeah. yeah. One was that ever an issue for you guys that you would kind of get grouped in with other people where you'd be like, well, this isn't really our vibe, but you know, yeah. maybe just the scene was too small. Or... Yeah, we make it work, man. We're we're like friends with everybody, or yeah. most people anyway. So, in fact, there's there's scenes that we love that we'd love to be a part of that we haven't even connected with yet. Like what? Like, we've never been to Ibiza. Okay. And not that like we don't really do drugs or anything like that, but not so not we're not dying to go for the scene. But right. Ibiza is definitely a place where you can play one ten to one twenty BPM funky music. Yes, and it's like you know, uh, there's no bangers, there's no drops. Right, it's yeah. just funky grooves. You're like absolutely hell, right. sign me up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, or like all those all those parties. Like I'm obsessed with Solomon. Mm. You know the producer. Mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with him. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I, I. He's great. He's incredible, and like his stuff doesn't bang. It's straight up just funky grooves. I'm like, they would love what we do, but he's playing like Croatia beat Croatian <laughs> right. beach parties. But it's like we have Bali, Croatia, Ibiza, and it's like we haven't even infiltrated that yet. Yeah, there is that whole European kind of. Beach scene, for lack of a better term, slash Thailand, slash. But it's hot. Right. It's not. It's not cheap. I mean, maybe it's cheesy. I don't. I, I don't care even. But the music is hot. Oh yeah, I agree. And it's. I think that scene is popping. Like I think there is a demand for it. When I first discovered Solomon, and like I discovered him without any context, because I literally shazammed a song, and it was him. And I went home and I listened to it for two hours. And I was like, this is so hot. Yeah. And then I called my brother up and I was like, who is Solo Moon? <laughs> and my brother goes, in, cer- in certain circles, he might be the biggest DJ in the world. And, Accurate. And I was talking to, uh, to the magician, who's more like in our kind of sphere, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, dude, tell me about Solomon. Like, do you know him? And, and the magician goes like, nah, I, I don't, you know, I know of him, but he's in, like in this other world. And I'm like, what world is it? And he's like, he gets paid more than David Guetta. And I'm like, what? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Where is that? It's like, unbelievable. It's, but it's it's cool. It's it is cool. You know, I so anyways, there's still so many things that we haven't even connected with yet. Yeah. And let's talk about your brother for a minute because, you know, he he was the executive producer for Head Over Heels. Yeah. Right? It seems like you guys have sort of affected each other's sound a lot over the years, you know, been influences to each other. In the early days when he was first winning all those big battles and all of that, was that like inspiring to you? Were you guys both making music at the same time? Or was oh, that- I mean, P and I were coaching him. Really? Yeah. Literally. P and I were coaching him, driving him to battles. It wasn't even like it's not like, hey, H chaperoning you- him. Yeah, it's not like, hey, you're inspiring us. It was all it was the wins were for all three of us. Yeah, we were yeah, driving yeah. him everywhere, coaching him everywhere, picking up his turntable. It was like always the three of us everywhere. Mm. So it was there was never any separation. I love that man. That's beautiful. And, and you like guys, the the title executive producer on this record, yeah. But he's executive produced all the records, really. Pretty so much, he's been involved. Yeah, in just yeah. pretty yeah. much. We just know. gave him the title for yeah, the first this time. This one now. was kind of a fun, funny thing. Like, all right, let's put it on this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was he doing specifically? Was he helping source guests and yes, kind of, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, helping source guests. Um, f- um, 
you know, listening to demos, giving feedback. At the end of the album, he was here every Song day. Song orders, you know, mm, down mixes, to details, mastering. Yeah. Going, to, going to, to, to mixing sessions with me, listening to all the masters. Was he kind of uh, the, the link or one of the links for the hip-hop guests on there, like French yeah, and all those guys? Absolutely, of course. Did French come here? No. Yeah. No. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> A-Track knows him, hung out with him a bunch. Because he did one of the Fool's Gold Day Off things right. early, right? Yep, that's when I met him. Yeah, there you go. I, I knew, you know, we had a very specific uh, vision for the French verse. And I, I'm friends with Harry Fraud, so I spoke to Harry about it. But I was like, I wanted to sound like a feature on a bad boy record in the 2000s. And those, so that's somehow he got it right away. It's like not too lyrical. It just sounds like a rapper jumping on an R and B, like a, a Total or an SWV record. Right. You give them like kind of, you give or them the flavor even only. Even Mace. Yeah. Yeah, and they show up kind of just long enough to like key, extend the vibe of the song. Twelve bars. Yeah. <laughs> Not sixteen. Twelve. <laughs> That's so specific. I yep. love it. <laughs> we, we grew up with that. Man. That was the idea. I mean, we we might never even have a hip hop feature again. I don't know. But, right. you know, again, like we had this specific mandate for Head Over Heels and that's what we wanted to do. Well, and I think you achieved it, man. I mean, the reception, at least from my point of view, seems like it's been super positive. Do you guys feel like you, you know, accomplished what you set out at this point? I think we did, yeah. Yeah. I, we're, I bet do you, you pay were, attention to critics? Yeah, I read everything. Yeah. P doesn't care. Mm. P gives no shits. <laughs> well, that's good. You got the balance then. Yeah, it's it's sort of my job in our duo. You know, the same way it's like I expect P to have all the synths wired up and all the mics working and all the MIDI working. I think it's my job to monitor the outside perception of the band mm. and to make responsible decisions uh, based on that. Interesting. You know? And so, I, yeah, I have to. It'd be weird not to like. I, I mean, I get that. Do you do you ever get to a point with credit? Like, does it get to you if yeah, somebody if says something a, yeah. negative? Yeah, it does. But like at the same time, like I tell myself, like after obviously after the first. Well, first of all, we're used to it because on our first album, a lot of people were shitting on it. People shat on us our whole career, right? Well, I think yeah, making the style of music that you make it looking like we look like. <clears throat> You know, it's we're I think an easy, it's just easy for we're an easy target. To insult easy yeah. target. <laughs> yeah, there you easy go. Target. Easy target. Well said, P. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm like, you know, fancy footwork, like that. That's people say it's like one of the great electronic music albums. You know, especially like of our generation. I, I don't want to brag. I've like no, I, it, I would agree with that. It's up there. You know. Yeah. And I, I pulled up old reviews that gave it two stars, mm. you know, and stuff. So it's whatever. What I try, when I read a bad review, I'm like, all right, this is a point of view and it's a contextual point of view and people have certain sensibilities at certain points in time and this is what it is. Yeah. yeah. The, the, last, the last time I cared about um, a review was back then in the fancy footwork and a bit later days... We got something from Pitchfork, and it was a sort of like a good review with some like backhanded, like you know, mm. um, how do you, how do you say that? A ba- like backhanded compliment. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It just felt like a backhanded compliment, and I was just like, "All right, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm not gonna worry about this. Like, people are just gonna say what they're gonna say." and yeah. You know. When I think the longer you do this, the longer you're in this kind of career, you sort of realize that all of those critics, I mean, it's just one person. Like I remember when I was in college, uh, I I have a music degree and one of the random classes I took was a music writing course. And there was this one guy in there who would all you know you'd go around you'd read whatever you wrote all that and he was just the most irritating obnoxious guy i thought everything he wrote was just garbage you know just one of those guys and then uh, a couple of years later i was looking at pitchfork and his he was writing for them you know and i was like okay so you know now one, once you kind of know how that sausage is made i mean to, it's, to me, it's, yeah. it's still a point of view like it's I, a, right yeah, I like it for that reason because if somebody, if somebody criticizes stuff about us, 
It just means that it rubbed that person the wrong way at this point in time. And I'm trying to, I try to understand what is it that might have rubbed them the wrong way. Not to say we'll change it, but like mm. just to understand, because you, to understand the perception, mm. you know, of Chromio from the outside. And, and I want to be sensitive to that. Um, doesn't well, mean I have to care about it so yeah, much. I, mean, I, I view great. them more as like, you know, uh, uh, customs agents where <laughs> it's the there you know it's such a per, it's you're there you know it's about that guy's mood and feeling at that moment it might not even necessarily reflect what he thinks yeah maybe he's having a bad day where he's gonna think in two months or after more reflection or after you know well, in either way, right? If they're right, if they're tearing you to shreds, they still had to sit and think about you and what you've done for mm-hmm. a long. You know, as long as people care one way or the other, you're probably doing something right. Yeah, we. I can't. Um, I've had a lot of traumatizing customs experiences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true. Wait, coming. Uh, coming to the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> like coming back from tour. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, we're not we're not U.S. citizens. Well, right. So, uh, yeah, that was my question. Yeah. It's like before you had the visas and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've had some scary ones. Canadian customs agents can be rough, too. Yeah, yeah. I've heard. I thought they were soft, but I've Yeah, heard. I think it maybe depends on the city. But there is a point um, randomly, kind of in the blog house days, like 07, 08, where I had uh, stumbled into this DJ residency in Toronto sort of before I should have been given an, a residency anywhere. <laughs> and so I was going to Toronto all the time, but I didn't know how to take care of kind of the the business the, that you, the, yeah, yeah. you know, all of that you should. And so every time I would go through, I just, my papers would be a mess. I would be, you know, sort of half lying and just not knowing what I'm doing. And man, <laughs> they, I was in that secondary. We've inspection. had a drummer band from Canada for a year. Oh, man. Once. <laughs> <laughs> How is it now? Any uh, any crazy tour stories if, in recent memory of you People know? People always ask us. But well, no, like, I, I and I, I hate that question. Yeah, like, what's yeah. your craziest story? But it's I'm like, we're not like, Guns and Roses. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I I'm not asking for party stories. I'm asking more about you know like a customs agent being a dick or like all of the airline loses all of your stuff. That's all happened to us. Yeah, all of yeah. that. The best. Yeah. I mean, nothing can beat uh, going to Serbia. Driving back from Serbia to Hungary, and the, bribing a customs agent with a pack of Marlboros. <laughs> oh man! Red, he wanted red Marlboros, <laughs> just to let you in. Yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah was I mean, who knows? Yeah, I, I mean, mean, that's not a you know, that's fine. Yeah. Pack of Marlboros. <laughs> we, we we yeah we. I mean, at this point, we're just focused on like keeping the operation running because you know it's it's. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot of moving parts. There's a big stage design. Yeah, I mean, just stage. from the logistical, I, I I was looking at the pictures of that new tour setup and just thinking about all the people that you would need to yeah. build that every it's night, to cart it around. Well, P can tell you all about it. Mm-hmm. That, that's one. That's one thing I don't. I'm a little more detached <laughs> from and P's. That's his world. He could tell you exactly. I mean, I just think even the money it must cost to like build that and. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, that right. I can tell you. Yeah. Also. I mean, how much does it cost at this point for a Chromio show to happen? How much is it? Isn't it like 40 grand? Yeah, 50 grand. Wow. Yeah. Th- that's the cost. Wow. Yeah. If we're out one day, you want us somewhere, the base cost of the show is 50 grand wow with the current setup yeah yeah so you guys are i'm sure you've always done this but maybe more now than ever investing heavily back into yeah yeah mm-hmm. i mean that's that's awesome and i think it's you look at those the pictures of the stage it's it's wild man i hadn't seen anything like that but uh, again we've been doing it for a while and yeah. we don't we don't want people to get jaded about us or we don't want it to look like we're just like complacent we want to feel like we bring something to the table in 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 a time where there's so much new music out yeah you know we've been around for 10 plus years so if we don't bust our asses on the road why would Lollapalooza book us right well and and for you personally too it's what we were saying earlier it's another challenge right it's another Mm -hmm. way 100% yeah 
like I was uh, reading some interview with Trent Reznor recently, and you know, Nine Inch Nails got known for their increasingly crazier and more technical live shows. Yeah, and then this new tour he's going on. He basically said, well, I felt like there was nothing more we could do with that. And so this new tour is just basically all black, huge amount of fog, and that's kind of it. Right. It's just a warehouse now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I kind of like that because, you know, it's the uh, it's same for him probably, right? right. You still got to keep figuring out what haven't I done yet. So, P, if you're involved with, you know, the logistics and building those stages and all of that, how much of your time does that eat up? You know, do you... A lot. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. On tour, it's a lot. Off tour, it's mostly about accounting, you know, tying up loose ends, preparing for the next tours. Yeah. But technically on tour, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's like eight guys to manage on the daily basis, and you're pretty hands-on with yeah, it? Yeah, really yeah. hands-on. I can tell you where every screw goes in the setup. Wow. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's Do you all, enjoy that role? Well, the nerd in me enjoys it, but also it's it's necessary. Like, we've grown, we've done it, we've done it ourselves since the beginning, and every time you add somebody to the crew... Um, you sort of look over and make sure, because at the same time, I'm thinking about the business side of it and the money in the back. Every, I'll give you a small, stupid example. Every screw that somebody loses costs me 10 cents. Okay. You know, if I'm behind that person and I'm double checking, we're not wasting money. Mm. People lose so much money without because they don't pay attention to sure. flights, to the gear that's being, you know, misused or not properly carted to the next location you end up there and like why was this packed like this this was stupid we just wasted three thousand dollars because this piece of gear is broken and if you and it does make so much difference when somebody is kind of gluing the whole thing together and being like well and all of that adds up right it it does add up when i honestly i love hearing that because i know a lot of artists who would rather just sort of hand it off to somebody and i'm not that person i'm much more yeah. in your mindset of just sort of having to know yeah. exactly but it's a, how it's it all a business works. once you hand it off to somebody who has no stakes in it then it just becomes sort of a circus you know hmm. yeah i think that's true is there anything we haven't covered anything you want to get out there obviously the new album is fantastic. The The tour is ongoing. I guess watch, watch for us. We're still doing our thing and, and, and we're touring like crazy. I don't know. What else? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's actually the, a good way to wrap it up is sort of where, where do you see yourself fitting in in 2018? You know, we were talking about different scenes that we were all parts of and we've come and we go is anyone even who's your competitors like i i don't know what scene you're in I, at this point are you just <laughs> in your own lane fully um yeah i mean scenes are have kind of crumbled yes you and, know because we used to be a big indie dance act but then yeah, you know and indie became pop <laughs> at some point yeah, somewhere right. along the line as did and EDM, rap became right? pop everything, everything became, became pop, pop yeah and the scenes sort of crumbled and we're just like, you know. But as always, we've done our own thing. We've lived in parallel of all the universes that were happening around us. So. And it didn't affect you too much, it seems like. It inspires us. Like when yeah. Calvin comes out with a funk album, like we listen to it, we're like, all right, it's inspiring. It's great. When Bruno comes out with a funk album, same deal. Like we just listen to what everybody else is doing and find inspiration there. Obviously, you know, our appeal with millennials is not going to be like little pumps appeal with millennials, right. but nothing you could do about that. So for us, it's just like, but we never, we never had the appeal from, you know, we had never had that sort of appeal for any generation. That's true. Mm. We always had appeal for the people who are interesting in other sorts of other kinds of music or, who are interested in the nerdy aspect, the synth aspect, or oh, people who just want to dance. There's still people a bunch just, of people yeah. who want to dance oh, yeah. and have a good time. That's I mean, who be knows? Constant. Yeah, we. Yeah, so I, I don't know who the com the competition is, and I, I I also 
don't know how much of a healthy mindset that is. No, because no. I mean, I I can fall. I was prey being facetious. To that. To no, no, completely. Extent. But I I could fall prey to that. But like, it changes so much. Yeah. Well, like, and you know, maybe it's worth saying that in this whole conversation, we've been talking about the way different things affected you guys. But I think it goes. It's worth saying that at this point, you guys have been around ten plus years, as you said. You've affected other people. You know, you talk about apparently Bruno and Calvin putting out these funk albums and all that. I mean, it to me, it probably you guys played some small part in that over the years, you know, putting those sounds out. Bruno the world. Bruno calls P. Is that right? Mm-hmm. What does he say? Funk, talk box, just questions mostly. Yeah. It is what it is. Like it, it, we love hearing people do it because it's like, all right, now we got to step our chops up. You mm. know? And I, like, there's people who are really good out there. Yeah. <laughs> really, really good. No joke. Like hundred percent. Like the bar is high. So it just keeps us on our toes. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, we usually just wrap up the show by asking a, a very simple question. You don't have to think about it too hard. Kind of just looking for random access memory. It doesn't have to be significant. Just a time in your life when in a moment, uh, music had a deep effect on you. And that could be, you know, gave you goosebumps or made you cry or just changed the way you thought about something. Could be from your childhood, could be from five minutes ago. Kind of just the first thing that pops into your head. When I, f- when I first heard uh, Man in the Mirror from Michael Jackson, mm. that was my Incredible. first like American music. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. Like, wow, this is deep. <laughs> Michael Jackson was the first thing I ever heard that made me really care about music. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Man in the mirror. I was I was feeling that. I still am feeling I was. That. I am the man yeah. in the mirror. <laughs> 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 Amazing. <laughs> Dave, anything come to mind? Beastie Boys, so what you want, video. I was like, this is how I need to dress. This is how I need to move. So you saw the whole vision. I was like, this is it. This is us. Like, I guess that's how kids feel now when they see like XXX Tentacion or something where it's like... From the style to the sound. To Tyler, the creator. So we're just like, this is the full package of coolness and where I need to be. And this speaks directly to me and all my sensibilities are all of them. Mm. It encapsulates everything I've ever liked. <laughs> right, you right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and maybe you didn't even know until you saw it 100%. crystallized. It would look like a skate video. They were wearing all the right outfits. It's a little bit of rock, a little bit of rap, a little bit, you know, they were Jewish guys like me. It was the whole thing, the whole thing. It was just like, that for me... Obviously, I, you know... So, I, had, I mean, they're they're also idols because of how they how they treated their career and how they extended their career many mm. times over. Reinventing. It's funny you should say that. I was buying some stuff earlier, uh, some uh, some gear for the shows, and they were playing... Um, you're gonna fight for your right. Yeah. To party. That in the 80s was like a meathead song. Right. And they completely changed and became you know they were always cool but they just happened to that song became a huge thing and they became like a sort of you know it wasn't just the cool kids it was everybody right right and yeah and then, and then they in the 90s to, they just stuck with like it, it was just what they did was incredible oh yeah and i mean that kind of reinvention and self-awareness i think is super inspiring that's why they're the best of all time yeah best group of all time we owe them everything. Mike D knows that. I told him. I think a lot of people owe them everything. They asked yeah. me to do my Quebec accent, like the one that I did in Ezra's. Uh, uh-huh. uh, Wait, what accent is this? In, uh, well, you have to watch Neo Yokio on Netflix. Oh, okay. It's Ezra's. Uh, I was reading about that show. Yeah, Ezra's like um, anime. And so, like, my real French Canadian accent, they asked me to do it for their audio book. <laughs> oh, shit. for like a small paragraph like they wanted like a Quebec voice exclusive watch out <laughs> well this has been awesome uh, great to see you guys great hanging out uh, and I think that's it good luck on tour thank you thanks for having us alright peace cool. All right.
right, that's the show. Shout out to Chromio. So good to see you guys. So glad we got to have that conversation. Catch up a little bit. Make sure to catch them on tour. Make sure to grab the new album, Head Over Heels. All of the links where you can follow them, find the new music, are going to be in the description of this episode. My name is Willie Joy. You can hit me up, backtobackpod at gmail.com is the email address, or you can hit me at Willie Joy or at backtobackpod on all social media. I hope everybody listening to my voice right now is doing well. I hope you're having a good week. Be safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you next week. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Peace.